everyone, welcome to Filipino on the Rise. I'm Crystal Fabella, host and founder. I really hope you enjoy this episode. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe so that you never miss out on new video content. You can find all episodes on most podcast platforms, including Apple, Spotify, Anchor, FM, and more. Thank you so much, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Our culture is so loving. I think we're constantly feeling like we're indebted to someone and guilt is very much a part of our culture. Yeah, we have been through a lot, but we don't always have to go through a lot. Our generation is coming to this realization that you don't always have to take it. You can't just always champion others. You got to advocate for yourself. Welcome to the Filipino on the Rise podcast, where I spotlight Filipino women doing big things and making an impact. I'm your host, Crystal Fabella, and I aim to promote Panay excellence, highlight Filipino culture and modern day successes, and celebrate what it means to be a Filipina. Today, we're talking to Sunel Barnes. Sunel is a memoirist, essayist, and educator from Manila, Philippines, and is the author of Monsoon Mansion, a memoir which we primarily discuss in this episode. She's also the author of Malaya Essays on Freedom, released last October. She earned an MFA in creative nonfiction from Converse College. Her writing has appeared in BuzzFeed Reader, Catapult, Literary Hub, and more. Her debut memoir was listed as the best nonfiction book of 2018 by Bustle and nominated for the 2018 Reading Woman Nonfiction Award. Barnes was the 2018 and 19 writer in residence at the Halsey Institute of Contemporary Art in Charleston, South Carolina, where she and her family live. In this episode, we discuss Nell's journey in writing Monsoon Mansion, a triumphant coming of age memoir. She shares her journey of becoming a writer and published author and finding reconciliation and healing with her troubled past. While the setting is in the Philippines, it also lends this universal experience of hardship and hope and has brought much reconciliation to many Filipino readers and beyond. We explore topics such as finding healing and reconciling with a difficult past, breaking generational trauma, and paving a new path for the next generation. We also discuss how Filipinas are at a tipping point in this current generation in which we are advocating for ourselves and reclaiming an expression of our identity. And she also discusses the Filipino writing community. And just as a little heads up, please excuse some of the audio recording being a little distorted on the show. Had a little mic trouble, but it's going to be such a great discussion. Can't wait. Here we go. Sanal, I'm pretty honored to be having you on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I feel like it's my honor. When my daughter asked when I'm recording right now, I said, well, it's a really important podcast because it's for the Filipino community. Mm-hmm. And you know, she smiled and she finally let me go and do my oh. thing. <laughs> oh my gosh, my heart. This is for her. And yes. Awesome. Well, the first question I always ask, in your own words, who is Sal Barnes? What do you currently do and what is your current mission? Yeah, I will go back to when I was at Penn about four years ago for a political content writing workshop. Um, it was all writers of color, which was just insane because I had never been um, in the same room or on campus as that as with that many writers of color. And it was just such a treat. And our very first activity was something similar to this. But our mentor asked us to basically on the spot give a six word memoir and that that kind of encompasses all of us in six words as inspired by Hemingway's six word memoir. And everyone was coming up with something brilliant. And I was really glad that I was at the end of the line um, and was one of the last. And I remember saying and counting in my head, you know, six words, writing my way back to shalom. And to me, shalom, the Hebrew word for peace or wholeness. And I feel like writing for me has been about that, piecing myself back together or piecing the world together, at least my world together, or the many different smaller worlds that I was a part of and bringing them into their wholeness little by little, however that was possible through my writing. I would say that that's still pretty much my mission and what I currently do. I'm currently coming out of the first few months of the release of my second book and coming in 
into the season of finishing up a book that I'm editing and also work for an NGO, an international NGO that provides water all over the world, really rural areas, disaster zones, refugee camps and settlements. Um, and I strategize content for them and deliver content from the front lines to the mass audiences. So in that sense, it's still pointing back to that six word memoir of writing my way back to Shalom or writing someone's way back to Shalom to you know, their wholeness um, and not just mine. So I feel like my first two books were about my coming together and my healing and my wholeness. And thereafter, I've just kind of gone on this personal mission of making sure that others are able to achieve that for themselves. Yeah. So now you literally exude when I hear you speak and the work that you do, peace. Like that's what I get from you. And it feels like peace. And I know that it took a lot of the hardship that you went through to get to that peace and then just really now bringing it out to the world. And I think that is such a great transition into the story because while the story was set in the Philippines, you know, it lends this, and we'll talk about this, but it it seems to have lended this universal experience Mm -hmm. of hardship and hope. And it has brought so much reconciliation to many Filipino readers and non-Filipino readers around the world, right? Yeah. We primarily discuss with Sunil her journey writing her memoir and debut book, Monsoon Mansion. So here's a quick synopsis of it. Set in the era of a newly post-Marcus democracy, Sunil Barnes was about three when her family moved into the Mansion Royale, a large and lavish home in the Philippines. Her mother was socially aspiring and had inherited wealth, and her father a self-made man, and life was a glamorous fairy tale. But when a monsoon hits, her father leaves, and her mother's cruel lover takes over, Sunil's fantastical childhood turns into a tyranny and nightmare almost overnight, while her mother becomes more unstable, and Mansion Royale turns into a site for cockfighting and even prostitution. Sunil and her brother are left to fend for themselves. The story is a powerful ode to survival, diving into the depths of a family dysfunction, but about a young girl's resilience and hope, graced by moments of unexpected magic. So the best way to frame this story is really by describing who my parents were. My mother was from the north, from the Ilocos region, and from a very wealthy family who had kind of this dynasty over this one part of the region. Basically, my mother's entire life, that was her background. And then my father's background was he is actually Bisaya, and he grew up a completely different way. He did not have shoes growing up. His family lived for part of the time between the ceiling and the roof of the palenque, of the fish market. Mm -hmm. And he didn't have a formal education until much later on. And, you know, was already selling peanuts on the street before age eight. And they met in Manila in 1981, I believe. It was was early 80s. The economy was booming. And I have, you know, there are these two people who are both so high achieving, so intelligent, and coming out of their separate traumas and their separate histories, their opposite histories and opposite families, and coming together you know, at the end of the Marcus era and are just amassing wealth. Um, that's really, wow. you know, unheard of for most of, you know, the Filipino population, but at the time was amassing wealth and was just climbing the ranks of the top 3% of the Philippines. Wow. And then, yeah, and then lost it all overnight because of two big well, I would say three big yeah. incidents, a monsoon or a typhoon oh. and that flooded our house and also the Gulf War that swiped away, basically pulled the rug from under my parents because all their money and all their industry was in the Middle East where the war was happening. And then third, it was just the collapse of their marriage. Mm-hmm. And long story short, I was trapped in this mansion with a mother who had just lost it all including her mind yeah 
Right. Do you remember what that period of when it flipped was like? How are you perceiving everything? When I was three, the book begins. That's when my narrative memories were forming. And some of my recollections are, of course, they're all shattered, you know. Yeah. Two second bits of memory that I slowly pieced together to put this book together to write it. Wow. I remember a knife in my father's bedroom, you know, door. And the fact that later on, I thought about like why my parents slept in separate bedrooms, you know, or I remember an actual flood. Like I remember being knee deep or even up to hip or waist deep in water, trying to catch a fish with my inside the mansion, you know, and just really absurd memory that did not make sense for all of my childhood and adolescence and early adulthood. What do you remember having to really have resilience as a child? Yeah, it started out us four. It was my parents, my brother and myself. And then my father left physically. And then my mother left mentally and kind of emotionally. And then my brother left too, eventually. And so I was left for majority of my childhood fending for myself in this Mm -hmm. abandoned mansion, you know, Mm -hmm. on the outskirts of Manila with no electricity, no running water, no food, nothing. I'm susceptible to all sorts of disease and danger and go from a really opulent mansion to just this haunted house to a Sabon arena, mm-hmm. yeah. cockfighting arena. Wow. The place is so large that it could actually turn into an arena. You know, but imagine a four to 12 year old living in that mostly by herself, wow. and for herself, picking up glass bottles, like Coke bottles to recycle. Yeah. So I could, you know, so I could turn it in for cash that I could buy. Right food for myself. Um, I do remember seeing something along, like while you got to stay at the school, I think it was a private school that you were at, Mm -hmm. but having a very different life in that (laughs) environment, like picking up um, bottles around the school. And Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I really was living a double life. I didn't know how, I mean, now it's really interesting because since Monsoon Mansion has come out, you know, I've had childhood friends who reached out to me and said, you know, some of them said, you know, I thought something was up. And for most of them, they just didn't know. And, you know, now some of them have messaged me saying, I wish we knew, I wish we could have helped. I wish there were better systems in place to make sure Mm -hmm. that children were safe in school and outside. And I just remember being coached by my mother to hide the fact that we were struggling and desperate so that I could stay at the school. You know, it was this top school. I I think right now it's like top three in all of Asia. And I owe so much to that school. The fact that I'm the writer that I am, I owe to that school. If there's anything my mom did right, despite all the things she committed, you know, Mm -hmm. I think keeping me in that school was one of the best things she ever did for me. Yeah. Even though it was one big lie. (laughs) That's beautiful that even through all that, there was kind of a space and a place that would still develop you and give you the skills that you would eventually need to tell this story down Mm -hmm. the line. And it says you had this complicated relationship with your mother. I don't mean to jump like so fast forward, but Mm -hmm. what was this relationship like? And in not so many words, but how do you feel like it's really developed yourself as, you know, the loving mother that you are now? I think the shorthand for it is everything that my mother was, I just didn't want to be. (laughs) I remember when I was pregnant, I read this quote, maybe on Instagram or somewhere like (laughs) that, where it said, be the parent you needed when you were little. Yeah. And I remember reading that and it just meant so much to me. Right. That I, whatever my mother did, I was going to do the exact opposite. You know, she was all about appearances and she consistently lied. And when she had mental health issues, did not seek help as is 
true for most you know people her age and people of that generation particularly in asian cultures you know i did the complete opposite the minute i could sense that i had ptsd or postpartum depression or anxiety or depression i just i sought help both form- formally and clinically and also you know with lay people that i'm insight and wisdom to offer. And so, yeah, things like that, or where my mother was lavish and just irresponsible. I've swung the complete opposite way. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Asked my husband right before this call was making a a grocery list and Mm -hmm. pretty much stick to that list, you know, with little treats here and there. And, And just, I don't overindulge, but I also don't, ever make it about guilt you know and it's not about deprivation or anything like that it yeah. just really swung the complete opposite way for my mom yeah oh and I bet your daughter has just such a like different and wonderful loving experience and relationship with you it almost thank you for sharing that it reminds me a little bit about my own mother as well. She grew up with like seven other siblings. I could be so wrong, but I feel bad. (laughs) A lot of siblings and kind of lacking a lot of deep personal affection. And I think Mm -hmm. a lot of Filipinos like, you know, not hearing like, I love you a lot or Mm -hmm. like affection. And she said that at a young age, she knew she was going to be a very affectionate mother and um, say, I love you more and and be very personal. And she's done that. So I, I feel grateful. And I, ultimately feel grateful for people like you as mothers who have had that kind of experience and just give a gift to your kids um, that which you didn't have. I just think it's really very beautiful. (laughs) So thanks for sharing that. Sunel eventually immigrated to the U.S. at 16 years old with desires to leave her past behind. She was adopted by a relative and while the adoption was finalized, she aged out of citizenship benefits and so became undocumented, which she described as a whole other battle and set of experiences that forced her to further neglect and hide away her childhood. And just never told anyone about it and I just really wanted to run away from it, really. It was just really overwhelming becoming an adult in a new country in New York City and dealing with all that and dealing with all that and so I just kind of shut it away wow. and the only person I ever told was my then boyfriend now husband mm-hmm. and one of the first things that he ever asked me that was the day we met so bold and he just wow. we walking on 6th Avenue toward I think Bryant Park or Times Square. And he just goes, tell me something you've never told anyone before. <gasps> and I was like, who is this dude? <laughs> <laughs> but I kind of like it. He wasn't and even ready for that. But I was not ready for that. I, mean, I dated around so much before him, and but was never. And I had always had this wall around me, you know, yeah. never. Like, yeah, I did around, but it was never where I felt like I let anyone see who I really was. And then in walks this dude who very first day he meets me, asked me, you know, to tell him something I've never told anyone. Oh my and gosh, I, did you? I did. And I just, oh man, where, where was this date? I, where was this conversation happening? <laughs> I think it was at Bryant Park. In oh, wow. Yeah. Where, did you shock yourself that you were sharing? I was shocked, but I, going back to that theme of peace, I felt so mm-hmm. at peace with him. Oh. Um, it felt like, and I've told him this, that when I met him, I felt like I had known him since I was little, which is weird because he grew up in South Carolina and I grew up in a boat. <laughs> and I was just like, I felt like had we met as kids, we would have been best friends. So like, you felt comfortable enough to share with him. Yeah. And I just told him everything. Wow. And then, you know, and as I'm telling it to I'm also trying to figure out, does this person believe me? Mm-hmm. Does he think I'm fabricating any of this? I don't even know. It's just it so it's just out of this head. world. Yeah. Yeah. And these are, these are my nightmares, you know, and these yeah. are like the things that come to me when I'm on the subway or these are the things that come to me when I'm in the middle of a class. 
and just like that, little memories or just little memories just little little snippets and just kind of like very randomly unloading each one of them do you remember something that you shared with him that kind of made him like gasp a little or no and i think that's why i kept telling him Wow. Because it was very steady, very nonchalant, and very unobtrusive. Yeah. And my whole life has been like everyone and everything kind of intruding into my space and into my privacy and into my health and safety. And finally, there's this guy who is just naturally mm -hmm. <laughs> unobtrusive and um, at the same time unapologetic about it. Yeah. Yeah. And fast forward, dating long distance, and then finally being in the same place and getting married and having a baby. As time went on, especially as a mother, she started struggling with these memories, memories of her childhood, never confronting it, and it was taking an effect. There were these truths about it that were unreconciled. I asked her about the journey to writing the memoir. What's so interesting is how Sunel talks about how the only way out is through. Memories are physical matter and they can't just be put away. I went from joyful, peaceful, sweet Sunel, who you know, dances in front of the mirror and is the loudest parent cheering on the basketball court to sad, quiet, almost like I was like allergic to people for a while, which is the complete opposite of me. And I went from, yeah, from who I was to who I wasn't, this other person that I didn't recognize. Was it just postpartum or uh, depression or, you know, other factors coming in? Yeah, I think it was definitely an onset of postpartum depression which from reading, I've learned that a lot of women who get postpartum depression are coming out of traumatic childhood and this oh. new onset of PTSD symptoms mm -hmm. um, start come to surface because, you know, we forget that memories are physical matter. They're yeah. not just impressions on our mind or like they're not, you know, figments. They're not things floating in the air. Our imagination itself and our memory itself, they are both very physical parts of our being. They are, you know, parts of our brain that function on oxygen and blood flow. And there are neurons and electrons yeah. and yeah. telomeres and, you know, it's it's so all there. there. <laughs> it's all there. It, that's yeah. what neuroscience is. And giving birth is this physical activity that's also equal parts spiritual activity and emotional activity that your body literally opens up and gives way to a whole new being and a whole new generation that's also carrying your DNA. Mm -hmm. And DNA is memory. Mm -hmm. you know? And so all these ancestral generational memories are coming through yeah. when you give birth, whether you know it or not. And right. all of that coming through me, my body just could not handle, my my mental health just could not handle, just yeah. my nervous system couldn't handle, and I just started breaking down. Mm. And again, my husband said, you know, you can't, you know, I, I grew up pretending, you know, and he said, you can't pretend anymore. And this didn't happen to you. All these things didn't happen to you. The only way the only through the other is through it. And so he just kind of prescribed to me outside of telling me to eventually go to counseling. He told me to write every time I sat down to nurse the baby and got me these index cards from CBS, like these three inch by five inch index cards. And he said, you know, you're not writing a book. You're not even writing an article. I know that's all intimidating. All you have to do is write one thing, one word, one phrase, one sentence, maybe a paragraph every time you sit down. And so I kept at it and we had a slow nurser. <laughs> and so I would sit in that rocking chair or on one end of the couch, you know, for 20 to 40 minutes at a time. And I would just write on these index cards. And by the time the baby was one and a half years old, I had three shoe boxes full. Which eventually became part and comprised a majority of the book, right? Yes. yes. Wow. That's so crazy. How, how long did that take total? Like nine months or? 
Ooh, the whole book took about six years. <laughs> oh, just kidding. But the index cards. <laughs> the index cards. Yeah. Yeah. 18. Yeah. yeah. Wow. wow. So these pieces were coming together on index cards, letting her really process the past. I asked her what finally took it from pen to paper to publishing. Sanel said she always loved school and loved learning. Here she was writing on her own at home in a nursery, at the kitchen table, while pushing the stroller. There was a part of her that really started missing learning. Cue her husband coming in, really supporting her to take on the next step. And again, my husband was like, when you're ready, there is a program, there's an MFA program out there that's close to my parents' house so that you can leave the baby with my mom. And your husband is just so great and supportive. Like, honestly, I can't. <laughs> supportive. And I'm just like, I can't. What? <laughs> yeah, like when I started voicing, like, hey, I might want to go back to school for another writing program, this time an MFA in nonfiction. When I had started opening up, about it and had started entertaining the idea he already basically had everything filled out and i just needed to sign my name for the transcript release form <laughs> and wow. i was just like well that's great because i've found you the perfect program um <laughs> where he just still, believes in you so much that's so beautiful he's just champion like that's just who he is like he he's a champion of others and yeah. I don't know if you're into the Enneagram at all. <laughs> I love, I, I'm obsessed. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm a three wing four achiever. Oh my God. Idealist. And yeah, I'm, I, I'm, I'm a different. seven wing three. It's weird. <laughs> yeah. That's a good one. <laughs> Is it? I can't tell. It's, that means you, you love people, but you also love work and you probably do your work for. Wow. You got this studied. You're just able to like call pieces together so fast. <laughs> yeah. So my husband is a nine wing one and he's basically he's a, a nine. Yeah. and a list maker. And so he <laughs> to bring harmony to people and to places and will make lists and fill out forms for that to happen. And wow, perfect. I get to be the recipient of that. And as the idea your admin work done. <laughs> As the idealist achiever, I can just keep achieving to my ideals. Achieving. <laughs> yeah, keep achieving and nice. keep having ideals. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. Yeah. And so so yeah. you you went through this and, and you got in the school mm -hmm. program. Yeah. Okay. And I was in that program for two years. And my last week actually my graduation week, the school had invited editors and an agent from New York, from these, you know, big publishing houses and, you know, brand name agencies. And I wasn't really expecting much. I kept thinking about it as, okay, this is practice for when I do the real thing, you know, and had put together a pitch, this elevator pitch and had gathered photographs that I collected from family and made a map of the house I grew up in. In case I was too nervous to talk, I could at least show something visual and just describe each room. And basically these pitches are like an episode of Shark Tank, like a TV show, where you get a couple minutes in front of these professionals who either say yes or say no, or maybe. And I think I was number four of six. More than six people definitely wanted a spot. And I somehow scored number four. And instead of having 20 minutes with this guy, we ended up talking for close to an hour. And he just ended up taking everything I had written at that point and took it to New York and said, and then emailed me a couple days later and said, I read everything on the plane. And oh my God. to New York and let's talk. I Hey everyone, I just have a quick question for you all. If you could have anyone on the show, who would it be? How important has it been to have a podcast show featuring Filipinos on the rise? I love putting this show together and I would really love your partnership in keeping it going and supporting it. I've just set up a Patreon account. I know, so exciting and official. And your financial support would be so appreciated and go directly to keeping the show going and towards things like better recording equipment and even more guests and content. Everyone who becomes a monthly supporter will get certain perks. Like, I will personally shout you out on the show. You can directly request for certain guests on the show and a lot more direct content straight from me. Your support also means that you are a part of the mission to elevate Filipina excellence around the world. 
world, please visit at patreon.com slash Filipina on the rise. And the link is also on the show notes. Okay, now back to the show. Yeah. And so I went up to New York. I remember thinking, oh, I've lost his interest. Like I've lost, I've lost him because he kept looking at his watch when we were talking. And I was like, oh, I should just excuse myself and go. I'm wasting this guy's time. And I excused myself, said my goodbye. He's like, where are you going? Where are you going? I, I've just been waiting to like, I didn't want to be so forward. I just, you know, will you sign with me? And I was just like, what? And I remember I did not physically hold the pen to sign the paper because I was in shock. I could not hold the pen to sign my name on that line and somehow I did it and then he and I worked on the book for another year and a half and then that was publishers and then and it was published in 2018 yes wow ah yeah I that's crazy I, I can't imagine how you felt like this is happening. It's materializing. It's coming into fruition. And I know how that process is, like when you're sending it to the publishers and you're going through the edits, but it's coming together. And I just want to know, when you wrote that, obviously, as you were coming, you were putting this together, you were probably going through a journey of reconciliating your own past and things that you had to. So what was happening within your heart, within the relationship with yourself, Sunil? And then what were your intentions for your readers? Because I, I know that we talked about, you know, this universal experience. Um, and were you hoping to provide comfort to other survivors of childhood trauma or bring out an, an experience that might relate? Yeah, it's interesting because when you put together a manuscript or a pitch or when you, uh, when you ultimately put together a book, you have to write these summaries, right? And that's just weird to summarize one's life when you're still alive and to even yeah. <laughs> write a memoir at such a young age you know people were always just like memoir you're so young like what you know I remember I would hear snarky comments like that and like what have you done and I'm like well I've actually lived through a lot you know um but to summarize your life or at least your childhood in five sentences Goodness. That in itself was an exercise. And I kept rewriting it, rewriting it, rewriting it. I wrote many different versions of that five sentence paragraph. And it came down to one of my writing mentors, Jim Minnick, finally was like, look, all a story is, is a sense of time, a sense of place, and a sense of attitude or feeling. And your last line is basically what you've walked away with that the reader will also walk away with. Mm. Oof. And that's a yeah, challenge. <laughs> it was a challenge. And I said, okay, sense of place, then that's a mansion. And the mansion was equally magical and fantastical as it was horrific. And he said, well, then say that. And then he said, well, what's your sense of time? And I was like, well, it's my coming of age. He said, then it's a coming of age story. And he said, what did you come of age from? And I was like, incredible hardship that set against this really lush and beautiful backdrop. As harsh as it was, it was lush and beautiful. You know, that's just the Philippines. You walk away with. And I said, hope. And he said, is that what the reader is going to walk away with? And I said, I hope so. I hope they walk away with hope. <laughs> And so I think that's been so true about this first book. And I received messages from all over, you know, Filipinos in the Philippines, Filipinos in the U.S. of different ages and different parts of the country and different stories and also non-Filipinos, you know, people who grew up in the middle of Georgia. I received this letter from a mom who apparently read my book while she was nursing, sat down to read it every time she nursed. And so it meant a lot to her that I wrote most of it while I sat down to nurse my baby. And she felt like we had a connection and she was going through postpartum and she was in like the throes of early motherhood that she wasn't alone and that there was going to be hope for her and that there was hope for her to heal from what she needed to heal from as a, as a young parent, as a woman. And I've had people from Malaysia and 
Australia message me. They've said either this was exactly my life and this validates it. This makes me feel like I can tell my story because someone else has and I won't seem so crazy to whoever I'm telling this story to, you know. And that's exactly what you were hoping to do as well, right? Because you said with your past, like no one would ever believe this. This Mm -hmm. is, you know, how do I own this truth? How do I even begin talking about it? Like, how do I validate it happened? And then, like I mentioned, when we talked, I felt like you releasing your truth unlocked other people's truth Mm -hmm. and their past realities about their childhood. And even when they're not from the Philippines, people from all around the world had reached out to you and said it really either resonated with them because of similar experiences or just in another way of like building that empathy or mm-hmm. understanding. So so what did what did that make you realize about like the readers or our universal um, experiences as as humans? <laughs> yeah. I think everyone has a story to tell and I think we all carry our own burdens Mm -hmm. and I think we all need to be reminded of the fact that we all come from light, you know, when I sign books, that's the, those are the two words I always write, whether it's a long dedication or it's just a bookstore signing, you know, that I have to do really quickly. I always write outside of my name, the two words of light. Just to remind readers that that's where they're coming from and that's where they're going. And I just don't want people to lose track of that hope that I really try to offer through my words and my story. We are all so, so greatly loved and we are all, there's so much hope for all of us. There really is. Mm -hmm. And it's coming from someone who writes for an international NGO who writes and sends out stories about refugee camps and war and famine and drought. Even there, even in those stories, I know that there's hope. Yeah, I love that. Sorry, I'm just letting that sink in. (laughs) You know, a lot of this feels very timely as I feel like a lot of women, you know, Filipinas around my age or older, a lot of us are in this time where we're really coming to understand a lot about our Filipino identity Mm -hmm. um, and starting to look back and really asking like, what does this mean for me now? What does this mean for generations? What are we trying to, how do we not push back the past, but how do we really look at it and reconcile with it? What are we trying to correct and do for the next generation? And I know that you said, even as the point we are now, it's really coming up about your own Filipino identity and and you had this thought about Filipinos, you know, being resilient but to a fault because we, you know, it's part of our culture mm-hmm. to withstand um, mm-hmm. and withstand and we're just coming to this tipping point of wanting to understand um, so that we don't pass on things to the next generation. So can you tell me more about that and kind of what do you see as this tipping point? Yeah, I think culturally, you know, there's this thing called utang ng loob in in our culture, which is like this sense of being indebted to someone. Like we're constantly feeling like we're indebted to someone and guilt is very much a part of our culture. I think our culture is so loving and so joyful and we're definitely peaceable people, but sometimes definitely to a fault where we say we're resilient, but sometimes it's a front. We mm. say- you know, we can we can handle most things and that we, we just take it. Yeah. And we just take it and we're people that has yeah, we have been through a lot, but we don't always have to go through a lot. You know, mm-hmm. we're not a people that really put up boundaries um, yeah. to protect ourselves. We're not really a people who value the individual. I, you know, the times I feel are this collectivity, this very communal spirit just overshadows sometimes the individual. And I think our generation um, is coming to this realization that there is no community if there's no individual. Hmm. And you don't always have to take it. Sometimes you push back, you know, and um, you can't just always champion others. You got to advocate for yourself. yourself. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think we're, we're getting there. And I think even things like remnants of colonial you know, mentality, yeah. like what is beauty and what is sexy and what is respectable and what is smart and who can you be and what jobs can you get? I think we're definitely coming out of all of that. And I'm so proud, like online when I read about Filipinas here and there and, you know, see them on Instagram or um, read an article in the magazine or even the New York Times or, you know, hear rap songs by like Ruby Ibarra. Mm-hmm. Yes. You know? And you're just like, yeah, we are coming to our own selves. You know, or mm-hmm. out of survivalist modes, we haven't allowed ourselves that. And now we have the vocabulary for it. We have technology for it. We have other means for community building. Yeah. We have the physical space for it. I think the generations before us, they did work hard to get us here. Absolutely. Um, and, and now, so- yeah. Yeah. And and on the whole survival thing. And now in this time of like, how do we thrive? How do we actually start to to embrace like our opportunities, our resources or reclaim our identity as it had been for generations just a point of survival and, and being under a regime or under like just it's like it was for generations just maintaining um, mm-hmm. Filipino culture. And now it's like, so we're here. Are we just supposed to maintain it or are we supposed right. to take it back into our own hands and reimagine like the Filipina identity because starting to re-release it by looking at our past and acknowledging it. And then now we're like, what do we, what do you do now? We don't stay in survival mode. We start to express. And I, I, I totally agree with you, but seeing it's really hopeful to see so many Filipinas now using their talents to mm-hmm. bring out these other forms, uh, our abilities that we're able to do, like you even said, the writing community, the Filipino mm-hmm. writing community that, that you're a part of, of different authors is just so, it's, it's growing and it's powerful. Well, it's been there, but I mean, you can probably share more about that and the, that community that you're a part of, right? And yeah. you've probably seen, like you've met and connected with so many people doing amazing work there too, right? Yeah, there actually is this moment. Well, I don't want to say moment because it seems so short, but <laughs> we're in this time. time. Of, yeah, of flourishing, I feel. I mean, there are many reasons for it politically and you know, economically and just slowly, but surely I hope that the publishing industry is changing. Mm-hmm. Um, there are also more platforms and media that allow for less heard voices to yep. be heard um for uh stories podcasting <laughs> okay <laughs> it's so important it's so accessible is what it is and we've kind of created this democracy for a medium you know and and it really has helped us progress and right. move our stories to the forefront mm-hmm. um and our think- stories aren't told by yes. anyone. Yes. And I <laughs> so it has to be too. us. <laughs> yeah, and I think something that I am just so grateful for is that the writing community I'm a part of, just mostly writers of color or Filipino writers, we're all really helpful, you know, and we're generous with each other. Or at least we try. We try to yeah. remember to be that. Um, one of my favorite Toni Morrison quotes is about that, that, you know, it's something like, once you get the jobs that you so brilliantly trained for, you know, your job is to get others there and it's not a grab bag Kenny game. And that's pretty much how I see it. Yeah. As much as I can help someone else, as much as I can, like, you know, as tired as I am, as much, <laughs> I tell my husband, like, my eyes are bleeding by 4.59 PM, but if I have to read your essay, I will. If yeah. I, yeah, if you need help editing and if I can't do it I'll pass it on to someone who can help edit it or make it better you know and I think because right, now you're helping another um, <laughs> person being their editor their book I totally agree with that I mean just even seeing the the Filipina community in my local area like I think it's I don't know if you're familiar with Entrepreneurs. yeah yeah but 
I'm just saying it's brilliant the kind of community with an entrepreneurship and just Filipinas building businesses here of this over generousness to help and to connect and to give resources just the way that we even like almost similar to the way that we make sure everybody eats and we <laughs> shove food and bought one and make sure there's stuff to take home and we put more on your plate. That's what's happening within our community when it comes to whatever work that we're building and whatever needs we have is just this like generosity to help each other because we got it. It's like, oh, it's time to build. We're going to make sure that everybody gets the help and the resources that they need. And I think that's the heart that you have and that you're seeing within your own community too. I mean, isn't it beautiful? So now it's just so unique also to, to this community. It is. It really is because I remember being a teenage girl looking for books or music or movies or anything that in any way resembled me or my mm -hmm. life, my mode of speaking or whatever it was and it was so limited like I remember I went to a, the Strand which you know is known for being like one of the most well-stocked bookstores in the world and I asked for a Filipino book and they only had one and it was Jessica Hackadorn's book which is still one of my favorites but I was just like it clearly can't just be one cannot be so, exactly yeah and yeah so, and that by the way, you've seen so much growth since it, then. Yes, definitely. I think, yeah, there's there's just more media now that allows us that. And there's this sense of generosity in the air somehow. Are we pulling yeah. each other up? Pulling um, each other up and kind of accelerating the <laughs> mm -hmm. process. Um, I love that. I, I, I also think it's this form of like revolution almost like, yeah, we're out here and we're going to make sure that everyone knows we're out here kind of thing. Well, it kind of reminds me of like the EDSA revolution and in the mm -hmm. Philippines where people were just linking arms. Mm. You know, Can you yeah. tell me about that? I actually don't know about that. Yeah, so it's part of our history of coming out from under um, the Marcos regime is the people power revolution where thousands of people just flooded the widest and longest avenue in Manila. And from that, basically impeached the president, wow. and who was a dictator. <laughs> you know? And that kind of happened again for Ed Sados when Eric Estrada was trying to make his term longer and basically removing you know, the four-year term from the system and basically creating a dynasty for him. Wow. Mm -hmm. Again, when was that? What year was that? I think that was in the late 90s or early 2000s. I obviously have to do my reading. <laughs> no, but it's amazing. But now I get to tell wow. you, this, you know, yes. that people, it's not so removed from our culture to link arms. Yeah. And I love that. Just start a revolution and be successful at it and make change through it i think oh my gosh that imagery is so powerful and i think of it as synonymous to what the filipino now community is doing when it comes to helping each other in the writing community in the, in the mm -hmm. entrepreneurship or the arts community just linking arms and i i don't see this like competitive tension mm -hmm. and you know it's it's this beholding and this partnering and this pushing it's it's great i love it <laughs> Yes, me too. And I hope it keeps going. And it keeps going. It's got to. Yeah. Uh, well, something I really want to kind of wrap up on is, you know, you've shared your story and it's providing something to, you know, it's helping build empathy maybe in people who don't have this experience, but understanding it in, in detail, but also providing comfort to other survivors of childhood trauma. So to listeners who may have experienced something similar in their childhood and their trauma. What words do you have for them in being able to journey there and reconcile? What, what is that light that you would want to share? Such a big question. <laughs> but, um, I, well, one, I think it's really important to impress upon everyone 
ask for help, however that looks in your life. It's hard for me to also really talk about all that without acknowledging that since I was little, I've also been a person of faith. That's my phone. I'm so sorry. <laughs> sorry. my computer. Um, <laughs> but that, that's just been part of my upbringing too. And that's yeah. just kind of evolved into my, you know, as I've evolved into my womanhood. And I think community is just so, so important. I wouldn't have written this book without the right people around me. I wouldn't have published it and publicized it but and, you know, gotten it to the hands of the people that needed to read it without a supportive community around me. I wouldn't have become the mother I am today and that I continue to be or I will continue to be without the people that surround me and support me. And you just cannot do any of these great things, these great but difficult things alone. And so I think to me, at least personally, that that's what all that light means. Mm -hmm. um, and that yeah. I myself as a carrier of that light, you know, and every, again, that's what I write in every book that I sign, you are of light. I think whatever that means, or whoever is listening, mm -hmm. they know what that means for them. Oh, thank you for sharing all that. And I mean, it hits me also because mm. it speaks to me. And without saying so many words, it kind of makes me think back and like things that I've even experienced. Mm -hmm. And we have ways to really gather our past Mm -hmm. and move forward with hope, right? I think that what you had gone through was truly so much, but then you were able to not only just push through, but create like beauty out of it and reach so many people in the world. And did you ever think that you'd be doing, <laughs> you know, no. did you ever think that coming to the US that this would be um, what you'd be doing X years later? <laughs> I had no idea. Something yeah. that um, I actually want to pull up a book really quick that I read that I want to read to you because I think it will mean something to you because I think you're a storyteller too. Thank you. And you are literally holding a microphone for yourself, but also <laughs> you're holding a microphone for other people, you know? And, and you're a storyteller yourself. And let's find it really quick but I actually have this book right here it's a book called The Art of Time and Memoir Then Again by Sven Burkertz and I think this is true of all storytellers whether they're memoirists or novelists or poets or podcasters or journalists or painters or ceramicists whatever they are um, I think this is true I'm going to read it to you and um, it says, the memoirist writes, above all else, to redeem experience, to reawaken the past, and to find its pattern. Better yet, he writes to discover behind bygone events, the dramatic explanatory narrative, the deeper incentives vary. There are memoirists who were hurt into their art, suffering trauma or loss, and there are those who were pushed to language by the richness of their early lives. I think that's true of all storytellers. We were pushed to language, to storytelling, to art, either by trauma or loss, mm -hmm. or by this richness that we've all just known to perceive yeah. since we were little. Yeah, that sometimes I try to put into words, like, what am I doing here? Like, what am I really doing? <laughs> but there's this need and this hardship that's pushing me to keep wanting to put light to mm -hmm. to these stories to stories like you because it's gonna fuel and build more like plant more seeds so I'm sorry I'm getting a little emotional. no don't apologize <laughs> Crystal don't ever apologize yeah. Yeah. I'm kind of at a loss of words because because sometimes like when you read things like that like I do a lot to push away like mm -hmm. any kind of attention on me because what I do is I want to spotlight you right but mm -hmm. I, it makes me remember like I'm putting in work for this bigger mission just as much right <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so thank you for sharing that <laughs>
Quick update on Sunel's most current work. Last October 2019, Sunel released a book called Malaya Essays on Freedom, a collection of essays on her experience coming to the U.S., becoming undocumented, and telling a story on her telling her story. We're about to have her shout out some other Filipino authors and their books that she recommends. A quick fun fact. Before I was a published author, I was actually an audiobook reader in New York. Of um, course you were. I'm not even surprised. <laughs> and so it just all came together and I could not fathom the idea of someone else reading my story. And it was just really good practice for me. Like my previous job was really good practice for me to read my own story. As yeah. You could imagine it was, a, it was quite an incredible feat to yeah. now basically relive all of it you know, right out loud. To read it out loud. Yeah. Well, your voice is so soothing that I couldn't imagine, like, not getting to read it. I heard I've caused a few um, car accidents, though. Oh, because oh, it's so relaxing and people it's just so want to sleep. Or it might be, like, a really tearjerker chapter oh, in the book. Oh, and people no. just, like, I'm like, they need to oh. put a disclaimer on these audiobooks. They need Do to be- not. Do not read this chapter travel. while you're driving. Yeah, yeah. And or people have missed work. Apparently, I got one message where, like, um, we had a book club at a school and we listened to your audiobook. And one week, there's <laughs> just stop coming to work. And I'm like, no, whatever. <laughs> um, which is also that is insane. Yeah. And I would be like, wow, my book has that effect on <laughs> I, I was more like oh no nobody missed their jobs their work um <laughs> nobody get fired but- hey hey that's that's how you know you've written some really compelling material right because when I was young and I this is really dumb but I read Twilight and I was so hooked I played hooky for two days <gasps> so I can skip school and read <laughs> yes and that you know and so the fact that I mean, I'm not saying that it's a marker of success, but it your it material. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, well, I'm definitely just so honored. I will ask two things for you, Sonal. Yeah. Can you shout out five Filipina authors? Yeah. Um, Elaine Castillo. Mm-hmm. America is not the heart. Um, her novel came out, I think, also in 2018. Um, Grace Belusan has a memoir out called The Body Papers. There's also Meredith Tolusen, also a nonfiction writer. I believe the book is called The Fairest. Randy Rebay, Rebay, I believe he was nominated for the National Book Award for his young adult fiction. And I am also really excited about my friend Matt Ortiles' upcoming nonfiction book called The Groom Will Keep His Name. Matt is one of the friendliest most energetic, most stylish people I've ever met. Just a brilliant writer and editor, and he's a managing editor for Catapult and basically started up BuzzFeed Philippines. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, and now it's just coming out with this, I don't (laughs) You guys just have to read it. Okay. Okay. You're making me want to bring on our first mail for Filipina on the rise. Yes. <laughs> so now thank you so much. So, so much for this beautiful discussion and truly shalom that you bring. Thank you so much, Crystal. I really enjoyed our talk to you and I wish I could just hug you in person. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that episode. Feel free to leave a comment about what you thought. And if you haven't yet, follow on Instagram at Philippine on the Rise. I hope to see you and hear from you there. Thanks, everyone.